author's note for an outcast of the islands this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tom weiss an outcast of the islands by joseph conrad author's note an outcast of the islands is my second novel in the absolute sense of the word second in conception second in execution second as it were in its essence there was no hesitation half-formed plan vague idea or the vaguest reverie of anything else between it and almayer's folly the only doubt i suffered from after the publication of almayer's folly was whether i should write another line of print those days now grown so dim had their poignant moments neither in my mind nor in my heart had i then given up the sea in truth i was clinging to it desperately all the more desperately because against my will i could not help feeling that there was something changed in my relation to it almayer's folly had been finished and done with the mood itself was gone but it had left the memory of an experience that both in thought and emotion was unconnected with the sea and i suppose that part of my moral being which is rooted in consistency was badly shaken i was a victim of contrary stresses which produced a state of immobility i gave myself up to indolence since it was impossible for me to face both ways i had elected to face nothing the discovery of new values in life is a very chaotic experience there was a tremendous amount of jostling and confusion and a momentary feeling of darkness I let my spirit float supine over that chaos. A phrase of Edward Garnett's is, as a matter of fact, responsible for this book. The first of the friends I made for myself by my pen, it was but natural that he should be the recipient, at that time, of my confidences. One evening when we had dined together, and he had listened to the account of my perplexities, I fear he must have been growing a little tired of them, he pointed out that there was no need to determine my future absolutely then he added you have the style you have the temperament why not write another i believe that as far as one man may wish to influence another man's life edward garnett had a great desire that i should go on writing at that time and i may say ever afterwards he was always very patient and gentle with me what strikes me most however in the phrase quoted above which was offered to me in a tone of detachment is not its gentleness but its effective wisdom had he said why not go on writing it is very probable he would have scared me away from pen and ink forever but there was nothing either to frighten one or to arouse one's antagonism in the mere suggestion to write another and thus a dead point in the revolution of my affairs was insidiously got over. The word another did it. At about eleven o'clock of a nice London night, Edward and I walked along interminable streets, talking of many things, and I remember that on getting home I sat down and wrote about half a page of An Outcast of the Islands before I slept. This was committing myself definitely, I won't say to another life, but to another book there is apparently something in my character which will not allow me to abandon for good any piece of work i have begun i have laid aside many beginnings i have laid them aside with sorrow with disgust with rage with melancholy and even with self-contempt but even at the worst i had an uneasy consciousness that i would have to go back to them an outcast of the islands belongs to those novels of mine that were never laid aside and though it brought me the qualification of exotic writer i don't think the charge was at all justified for the life of me i don't see that there is the slightest exotic spirit in the conception or style of that novel it is certainly the most tropical of my eastern tales the mere scenery got a great hold on me as i went on perhaps because I may just as well confess that the story itself was never very near my heart it engaged my imagination much more than my affection as to my feeling for willems it was but the regard one cannot help having for one's own creation 
obviously I could not be indifferent to a man on whose head I had brought so much evil simply by imagining him such as he appears in the novel, and that, too, on a very slight foundation. The man who suggested Willems to me was not particularly interesting in himself. My interest was aroused by his dependent position, his strange, dubious status of a mistrusted, disliked, worn-out European living on the reluctant toleration of that settlement hidden in the heart of the forest land, up that somber stream which our ship was the only white man's ship to visit. With his hollow, clean-shaved cheeks, a heavy gray moustache and eyes without any expression whatever, clad always in a spotless sleeping suit much befrogged in front, which left his lean neck wholly uncovered, and with his bare feet in a pair of straw slippers, he wandered silently amongst the houses in daylight, almost as dumb as an animal, and apparently much more homeless. I don't know what he did with himself at night. He must have had a place, a hut, a palm-leaf shed, some sort of hovel where he kept his razor and his change of sleeping suits. An air of feudal mystery hung over him, something not exactly dark, but obviously ugly. The only definite statement I could extract from anybody was that it was he who had brought the Arabs into the river. That must have happened many years before. But how did he bring them into the river? He could hardly have done it in his arms with a lot of kittens. I knew that Almayer founded the chronology of all his misfortunes on the date of that fateful advent, and yet the very first time we dined with Almayer there was Willems sitting at table with us in the manner of the skeleton at the feast, obviously shunned by everybody, never addressed by any one, and for all recognition of his existence getting now and then from Almayer a venomous glance which I observed with great surprise. In the course of the whole evening he ventured one single remark, which I didn't catch, because his articulation was imperfect, as of a man who had forgotten how to speak. I was the only person who seemed aware of the sound. Willems subsided. Presently he retired, pointedly unnoticed, into the forest, maybe. Its immensity was there, within three hundred yards of the veranda, ready to swallow up anything. Almayer, conversing with my captain, did not stop talking while he glared angrily at the retreating back. Didn't that fellow bring the Arabs into the river? Nevertheless, Willems turned up next morning on Almayer's veranda. From the bridge of the steamer I could plainly see those two breakfasting together, tete and, I suppose, in dead silence, one with his air of being no longer interested in this world, and the other raising his eyes now and then with intense dislike. It was clear in those days Willems lived on Almayer's charity, yet on returning two months later to Sambir, I heard that he had gone on an expedition up the river in charge of a steam launch belonging to the Arabs to make some discovery or other. On account of the strange reluctance that everyone manifested to talk about Willems, it was impossible for me to get at the rights of that transaction. Moreover, I was a newcomer, the youngest of the company, and, I suspect, not judged quite fit as yet for a full confidence. I was not much concerned about that exclusion. The faint suggestion of plots and mysteries pertaining to all matters touching Almayer's affairs amused me vastly. Almayer was obviously very much affected. I believe he missed Willems immensely. He wore an air of sinister preoccupation and talked confidentially with my captain. I could catch only snatches of mumbled sentences. Then one morning, as I came along the deck to take my place at the breakfast table, Almayer checked himself in his low-toned discourse. My captain's face was perfectly impenetrable. There was a moment of profound silence, and then, as if unable to contain himself, Almayer burst out in a loud, vicious tone. One thing's certain, if he finds anything worth having up there, they will poison him like a dog. Disconnected though it was, that phrase, as food for thought, was distinctly worth hearing. We left the river three days afterwards, and I never returned to Sambir, but whatever happened to the protagonist of my villains, nobody can deny that I have recorded for him a less squalid fate. J.C. 1919
Part One, Chapter One of An Outcast of the Islands. When he stepped off the straight and narrow path of his peculiar honesty, it was with an inward assertion of unflinching resolve to fall back again into that monotonous but safe stride of virtue as soon as his little excursion into the wayside quagmires had produced the desired effect. It was going to be a short episode, a sentence in brackets, so to speak, in the flowing tale of his life a thing of no moment to be done unwillingly yet neatly, and to be quickly forgotten. He imagined that he could go on afterwards looking at the sunshine, enjoying the shade, breathing in the perfume of flowers in the small garden before his house. He fancied that nothing would be changed, that he would be able as heretofore to tyrannize good-humouredly over his half-caste wife, to notice with tender contempt his pale yellow child, to patronize loftily his dark-skinned brother-in-law, who loved pink neckties and wore patent-leather boots on his little feet, and was so humble before the white husband of the lucky sister. Those were the delights of his life, and he was unable to conceive that the moral significance of any act of his could interfere with the very nature of things, could dim the light of the sun, could destroy the perfume of the flowers, the submission of his wife the smile of his child, the awestruck respect of Leonard de Souza and of all the de Souza family. That family's admiration was the great luxury of his life. It rounded and completed his existence in a perpetual assurance of unquestionable superiority. He loved to breathe the coarse incense they offered before the shrine of the successful white man, the man that had done them the honor to marry their daughter, sister, cousin the rising man sure to climb very high, the confidential clerk of Hudik and Company. They were a numerous and an unclean crowd, living in ruined bamboo houses, surrounded by neglected compounds on the outskirts of Makaske. He kept them at arm's length and even further off, perhaps having no illusions as to their work. They were a half-caste lazy lot, and he saw them as they were. Ragged, lean, unwashed, undersized men of various ages, shuffling about aimlessly in slippers. Motionless old women who looked like monstrous bags of pink calico stuffed with shapeless lumps of fat, and deposited askew upon decaying rattan chairs in shady corners of dusty verandas. Young women, slim and yellow, big-eyed, long-haired, moving languidly amongst the dirt and rubbish of their dwellings as if every step they took was going to be their very last. He heard their shrill quarrelings, the squabbling of their children, the grunting of their pigs. He smelt the odors of the heaps of garbage in their courtyards, and he was greatly disgusted. But he fed and clothed that shabby multitude, those degenerate descendants of Portuguese conquerors. He was their providence. He kept them singing his praises in the midst of their laziness, of their dirt, of their immense and hopeless squalor, and he was greatly delighted. They wanted much, but he could give them all they wanted without ruining himself. In exchange he had their silent fear, their loquacious love, their noisy veneration. It is a fine thing to be a providence, and to be told so on every day of one's life. It gives one a feeling of enormously remote superiority, and Willems reveled in it. He did not analyze the state of his mind, but probably his greatest delight lay in the unexpressed but intimate conviction that, should he close his hand, all those admiring human beings would starve. His munificence had demoralized them, an easy task. Since he descended amongst them and married Joanna, they had lost the little aptitude and strength for work they might have had to put forth under the stress of extreme necessity they lived now by the grace of his will. This was power. Willems loved it. In another, and perhaps a lower plane, his days did not want for their less complex but more obvious pleasures. He liked the simple games of skill, billiards, also games not so simple, and calling for quite another kind of skill, poker. He had been the aptest pupil of a steady-eyed, centenious American who had drifted mysteriously in the Macassa from the wastes of the Pacific, and, after knocking about for a time in the eddies of town life, 
had drifted out enigmatically into the sunny solitudes of the Indian Ocean. The memory of the California stranger was perpetuated in the game of poker, which became popular in the capital of Celebes from that time, and in a powerful cocktail, the recipe for which is transmitted in the Kwangtung dialect from head boy to head boy of the Chinese servants in the Sunda Hotel even to this day. Willems was a connoisseur in the drink and an adept at the game. Of these accomplishments he was moderately proud. Of the confidence reposed in him by Hudik, the master, he was boastfully and obtrusively proud. This arose from his great benevolence and from an exalted sense of his duty to himself and the world at large. He experienced that irresistible impulse to impart information which is inseparable from gross ignorance. There is always something which the ignorant man knows, and that thing is the only thing worth knowing. It fills the ignorant man's universe. Willems knew all about himself. On the day when, with many misgivings, he ran away from a Dutch East India man in Samarang Roads, he had commenced that study of himself, of his own ways, of his own abilities, of those fate-compelling qualities of his which led him toward that lucrative position which he now filled. Being of a modest and diffident nature, his successes amazed, almost frightened him, and ended, as he got over the succeeding shocks of surprise, by making him ferociously conceited. He believed in his genius and in his knowledge of the world. Others should know of it also, for their own good and for his greater glory. All those friendly men who slapped him on the back and greeted him noisily should have the benefit of his example. For that he must talk. He talked to them conscientiously. In the afternoon he expounded his theory of success over the little tables, dipping now and then his mustache in the crushed ice of the cocktails. In the evening he would often hold forth, cue in hand, to a young listener across the billiard table. The billiard balls stood still as if listening also under the vivid brilliance of the shaded oil lamps hung low over the cloth, while away in the shadows of the big room the Chinaman marker would lean warily against the wall, the blank mask of his face looking pale under the mahogany marking board. His eyelids drooped in the drowsy fatigue of late hours and in the buzzing monotony of the unintelligible stream of words poured out by the white man. In a sudden pause of the talk, the game would recommence with a sharp click and go on for a time in the flowing soft whirr and the subdued thuds as the balls rolled zigzagging towards the inevitably successful cannon. Through the big windows and the open doors the salt dampness of the sea, the vague smell of mold and flowers from the garden of the hotel drifted in and mingled with the odor of lamp oil growing heavier as the night advanced. The players' heads dived into the light as they bent down for the stroke, springing back again smartly into the greenish gloom of broad lamp shades. The clock ticked methodically. The unmoved Chinaman continuously repeated the score in a lifeless voice, like a big talking doll, and Willems would win the game. With the remark that it was getting late and that he was a married man, he would say a patronizing good night and step out into the long, empty street. At that hour its white dust was like a dazzling streak of moonlight where the eye sought repose in the dimmer gleam of rare oil lamps. Willems walked homewards following the line of walls overtopped by the luxuriant vegetation of the front gardens. The houses right and left were hidden behind the black masses of flowering shrubs. Willems had the street to himself. He would walk in the middle, his shadow gliding obsequiously before him. He looked down on it complacently, the shadow of a successful man. He would be slightly dizzy with the cocktails and with the intoxication of his own glory. As he often told people, he came east fourteen years ago, a cabin boy, a small boy. His shadow must have been very small at that time. He thought with a smile that he was not aware then he had anything, even a shadow, which he dared call his own and now he was looking at the shadow of the confidential clerk of Hudik and Company going home. How glorious! How good was life for those that were on the winning side! 
he had won the game of life, also the game of billiards. He walked faster, jingling his winnings, and thinking of the white stone days that had marked the path of his existence. He thought of the trip to Lombok for ponies, that first important transaction confided to him by Hudig. Then he reviewed the more important affairs, the quiet deal in opium, the illegal traffic in gunpowder, the great affair of smuggled fired arms, the difficult business of the Raja of Goat. He carried that last through by sheer pluck. He had bearded the savage old ruler in his council room. He had bribed him with a gilt glass coach, which, rumor said, was used as a hen-coop now. He had over-persuaded him. He had bested him in every way. That was the way to get on. He disapproved of the elementary dishonesty that dips the hand in the cash-box, but one could evade the laws and push the principles of trade to the furthest consequences. Some call that cheating. Those are the fools, the weak, the contemptible. The wise, the strong, the respected, have no scruples. Where there are scruples there can be no power. On that text he preached often to the young men. It was his doctrine, and he himself was a shining example of its truth. Night after night he went home thus, after a day of toil and pleasure, drunk with the sound of his own voice celebrating his own prosperity. On his thirtieth birthday he went home thus. He had spent in good company a nice noisy evening, and as he walked along the empty street the feeling of his own greatness grew upon him, lifted him above the white dust of the road, and filled him with exultation and regrets. He had not done himself justice over there in the hotel. He had not talked enough about himself. He had not impressed his hearers enough. Never mind, some other time. Now he would go home and make his wife get up and listen to him. Why should she not get up and mix a cocktail for him and listen patiently? Just so, she shall. If he wanted, he could make all the D'Souza family get up. He had only to say a word, and they would all come and sit silently in their night vestments on the hard, cold ground of his compound, and listen as long as he wished to go on explaining to them from the top of the stairs how great and good he was. They would, however his wife would do, for tonight. His wife, he winced inwardly, a dismal woman with startled eyes and dolorously drooping mouth that would listen to him in pain, wonder, and mute stillness. She was used to those night discourses now. She had rebelled once at the beginning, only once. Now, while he sprawled in the long chair and drank and talked, she would stand at the further end of the table, her hands resting on the edge, her frightened eyes watching his lips without a sound, without a stir, hardly breathing, till he dismissed her with a contemptuous, "'Go to bed, dummy!' She would draw a long breath then and trail out of the room, relieved but unmoved. Nothing could startle her, make her scold or make her cry. She did not complain, she did not rebel. That first difference of theirs was decisive too decisive, thought Willems, discontentedly. It had frightened the soul out of her body, apparently. A dismal woman. A damned business altogether. What the devil did he want to go and saddle himself? Ah, well, he wanted a home, and the match seemed to please Hudig, and Hudig gave him the bungalow, that flower-bowered house to which he was wending his way in the cool moonlight, and he had the worship of the D'Souza tribe. A man of his stamp, could carry off anything, do anything, aspire to anything. In another five years those white people who attended the Sunday card-parties of the governor would accept him, half-caste, wife and all. Hooray! He saw his shadow dart forward and wave a hat, as big as a rum-barrel, at the end of an arm several yards long. Who shouted hooray? He smiled shamefacedly to himself, and, pushing his hands deep into his pockets, walked faster with a suddenly grave face. Behind him, to the left, a cigar end glowed in the gateway of Mr. Vink's front yard. Leaning against one of the brick pillars, Mr. Vink, the cashier of Hudik and Company, smoked the last cheroot of the evening. Amongst the shadows of the trim bushes Mrs. Vink crunched slowly, with measured steps, the gravel of the circular path before the house. 
there's Willems going home on foot and drunk, I fancy, said Mr. Vink over his shoulder. I saw him jump and wave his hat. The crunching of the gravel stopped. Horrid man, said Mrs. Vink calmly. I heard he beats his wife. Oh, no, my dear, no, muttered absently Mr. Vink with a vague gesture. The aspect of Willems as a wife-beater presented to him no interest. How women do misjudge! If Willems wanted to torture his wife, he would have recourse to less primitive methods. Mr. Vink knew Willems well, and believed him to be very able, very smart, objectionably so. As he took the last quick draws at the stump of his cheroot, Mr. Vink reflected that the confidence accorded by Hudick to Willems was open, under the circumstances, to loyal criticism from Hudick's cashier. He is becoming dangerous. He knows too much. He will have to be got rid of, said Mr. Vink aloud. But Mrs. Vink had gone in already, and after shaking his head he threw away his cheroot and followed her slowly. Willems walked on homeward, weaving the splendid web of his future. The road to greatness lay plainly before his eyes, straight and shining, without any obstacle that he could see. He had stepped off the path of honesty as he understood it, but he would soon regain it, never to leave any more. It was a very small matter. He would soon put it right again. Meantime his duty was not to be found out, and he trusted in his skill, in his luck, in his well-established reputation that would disarm suspicion if anybody dared to suspect. But nobody would dare. True, he was conscious of a slight deterioration. He had appropriated temporarily some of Hudick's money, a deplorable necessity. But he judged himself with the indulgence that he should be extended to the weaknesses of genius. He would make reparation, and all would be as before. Nobody would be the loser for it and he would go on unchecked toward the brilliant goal of his ambition. Hudick's partner. Before going up the steps of his house he stood for a while, his feet well apart, chin in hand, contemplating mentally Hudick's future partner. A glorious occupation. He saw him quite safe, solid as the hills, deep, deep as an abyss, discreet as the grave. End of chapter 1 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com.